Greetings. You're tuned to the VoIP Users Conference, VUC, VoIP and Tell Us, episode 415. And before we get into all that goodness, I want to tell you about Voxale Labs. They do tropo.com, among many other things. Go there, tropo, T-R-O-P-O dot com. Start developing. Our friend Michael White at E4 Strategies is giving away today a Sangoma Vega 50 Series Gateway. Someone is going to win that in a little while. Sangoma.com and E4Strategies.com, of course. Our PBX is provided by OnSip.com, Junction Networks. Those folks have been around for a long time and have always been good support to us. Of course, we wouldn't have the great sound if we weren't coming through ZipDX.com, a fantastic conference server, full-featured, wideband. Do it. Our local rate dial-ins are provided by VoxBone.com. Take it to the bridge. We are live on YouTube. And watch. Okay, everybody, this is 415 VoIP Users Conference. We're happy to have with us, uh, uh, with uh, Flow Route, Bayan Tofik. Bayan, welcome. This is your first time with us. Welcome to you. Thanks. It's great to be here. It's nice to have you and a whole bunch of other people. Too long to name, actually, probably. So we'll just get with it right now. Uh, first of all, Bayan, I'd love to hear a little bit about your background, how you landed where you are today uh, in, in, a, in a couple of sentences or a couple of paragraphs, whatever you want. What is your background? So I... I grew up in, uh, around telephones from a very young age, 13, 14 years old. My dad had a software company, and my uncle in the early days of the Internet had an ISP and a colo company. So in the summers, instead of going, going and playing, playing with all my friends, I'd want to go to work and get involved in the tech stuff and also in the, on the business side. So uh, I, I was always getting in trouble on the telephone, spent hours and hours on the pay phones all the time. And I uh, eventually got into vulnerability development and did source code analysis when I was 15, 16 years old. And uh, when I was 17, I, uh, I found a major vulnerability for Toshiba that saved them 20, 30 million dollars and then got back into vulnerability development in college. My second year of college, I found the first remote root vulnerability in Asterisk. So that, that brought me back into telecom and I started, started doing telecom consulting. Moved to the Philippines right after college for a contract and it fell through and while, while I was there we, we started Flora. J Jordan and I, my business partner, had this idea and then Sean Shea, uh, our third partner, joined, joined us just a few months in and we started it not because we wanted to start a voice over IP company or, or a SIP uh, trunking company but we started because we had set up this prototype for a company called, that we created called Isotalk to provide secure communication services. And we, we wanted to allow people to call regular telephones as well. But the issue was that we could hide it in plain sight if we stripped the caller ID and everything, but we had no traffic to blend it into. So my great idea was, well, let's start a telephone company. It can't be that hard. <laughs> so we started FlowRoute in 2007 uh, with about $300 just to pay for the LLC filing fees and the registered agent. And we became profitable that first year. Very cool story. Uh, your target audience, I believe that you're more of a wholesale, wholesale uh, outfit. Oh, by the way, I had something I wanted to show and I forgot about this. This is really funny from Astrocon. Uh, this was the, the little thing that was outside one of the uh, presentations, I guess. Let me put this up big. So it was, uh, it's just it's good. He shows good humor. It's very clever. I published the photo that I took. Uh, and I think it was on Google Plus, but anyway, cute little use of uh, humor that they had outside of one of the Astrocon uh, presentations. Uh, what was the Astrocon presentation, by the way, by Florout? You recall? Florout did, Flora didn't have an Astrocon presentation. You were just there. So we were one of the there. sponsors, maybe, huh? Yeah, we, we, we were one of, the, one of the sponsors, one of the smaller sponsors there, but we got a lot of attention. Okay, so anyway, getting back to your target audience in, at FlowRoute is what? Who? So we, we're, 
Fl flow route is, is to us a telephony abstraction layer. So we're, we're an abstraction layer for the PSTN. And, and we try not to get past that. We're not looking to process audio or provide IP centrics or hosted services. We, we don't want, want to get into any residential or, or, or retail type services. We're looking to abstract away some of the complexity of the telephone network to provide services over SIP that are flexible, scalable, and, and automated. So to provide open APIs and on-demand capacity and phone numbers. Okay, so what, um, what distinguishes FlowRound from the rest? And by the way, I don't even know who the competitors would be, but the rest of the pack, what's, what's actually the difference? What's the originality here? So in 2007, at Vaughn, uh, I, I was invited to, to Vaughn with, with a group of Camilio guys, right, when that project started. Mm -hmm. And in one of the plenary sessions, there was, there was Skype there, uh, VP of Skype, CTO of British Telecom, and, and a few other people. And they were talking about the direction of telecom and, and IMS and fixed mobile convergence and all these things and moving to IP. And I stood up and asked, asked them a question. I said, why is it that with this move to voice over IP, where we're trying to take advantage of the, of the packet switch network, are all of your networks virtual circuit switched on top? Why is everybody using session border controllers and, and taking media and signaling through the same path where you have all the flaws of a packet switch network with all the problems of a circuit switch network? So w w when we started FlowRoute, w one of the fundamental beliefs we had was that we need to build a system that's high performance that separates out this, this audio stream from the signaling stream. And it's more difficult than it sounds. From a billing perspective, it's a little more difficult. But also from uh, dealing with problems like network address translation and, and bu buggy clients that try to do symmetric latching. And we, we have some technologies that, that we're, we're patenting right now uh, that, that have allowed us to solve some of these issues in, in interesting ways. But our fundamental belief is that with voice over IP, there should be close to zero incremental cost of carrying traffic. And by getting out of, this, out of the media stream, if we have a customer in India calling Italy, it can go directly to our peering partner, Telecom Italia, in Rome from the, our customer's internet connection in India without worrying about where our servers are or, or jitter from coming to the United States and back or additional latency. Okay, well, let's, let's pause. I asked in IRC, don't see any responses, but any, does anyone on our panel here, our erudite and distinguished panel, I may say, uh, have any questions? I can't believe it. I've never seen Andy Abramson without it, <laughs> a comment or question, but uh, anyone else? So, so does this mean basically that you don't do any media handling at all, or, or that you're trying to stay away from media handling in general? So we... We don't do, do any media handling or proxying on our network. We do some tricky things with the media while being out of the media stream uh, occasionally, but we're, when, we, we have sometimes 10, 15,000 simultaneous calls going over our network, and we're using five, six megabits per second of bandwidth. So that's just primarily signaling then? It's all signaling. It's all signaling. There is a question in IRC uh, from Lauren who asks about up. He's curious about uptime stats and how close to the uh, to the five nine holy grail you get. Five nines. We have uh, the the flowout architecture is 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 a distributed architecture across two data centers. We, we have excellent down to, uh, uh, excellent uptime in that our, our data centers, even if there's a net split or one goes, goes offline completely, as long as, as customers are connected to both the, the data centers, even when there are issues, inbound and outbound calling work completely. And, and so we, we've, we've had for, for all of our customers 
who are interconnected to both over the past year 100% of time. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? You type them into IRC. Uh, I have a couple of comments. Of, I don't know how much we want to get into this, but you mentioned the word patent, Brian, and um, that's a pretty contentious subject these days. And I just wondered if you had anything to say about patents, your thoughts about patents and innovating. Uh, you folks, if you're trying to get patents, obviously, you know, one assumes that, that you have things to patent, so there, you have ideas, you have, you know, how do you see that? Can, is there some general statement you'd care to make on that, that philosophy? Yeah, I, personally, I don't believe in software patents. And, and the patents that we're going after are more defensive in nature. Mm. Still, there's a change in patent law c coming this year, in just a few months, where we're moving to first to file in the United States, where we'll sync up with the rest of the world for the most part, except for some uh, s specifics in the law that, that, that make it a bit more complicated just, just because the definitions that we have on prior art and so on. So with, w with that coming, we're, we're in a rush right now to, to patent a few of our technologies that we've developed in, in this past year to ensure that we're protected. Yeah, it is. I understand the defensive. It, it's a really a weird topic. Uh, it has to be addressed. So you have to defend it. That's that's you know if you if you do nothing uh, un, unless the laws change, you're to put it in uh, good French, you're going to be screwed. Anyway, <laughs> moving right along. Um, we you also mentioned uh, cost, and uh, as I think everyone here realizes. You remember the, the uh, trade shows, VoIP trade shows of 2004, 2005, 6. We suddenly saw people um, were saying, uh, yeah, the, the cost per minute is going to be zero pretty soon. It's going to be very close to it. And it kind of is, isn't it now? I mean, other, if you discount mobile anyway, and even that's going to happen sooner or later with VoIP and so on. Um, so basically, we're talking service. Now you mentioned being not being in the uh, loop, not the loop, but the uh, uh, staying out of the media. Uh, what are the what are the great services that we can look for in the future that are not going to be? Gosh, it's only ten cents a minute, <laughs> which would be ridiculous, of course. Now, but even a penny a minute, even point oh one cents a minute, is kind of a silly metric now. So, what else are we going to be looking at soon? So, so, so I think that the, 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 the cost of minutes is definitely going down. And there's, there, there's already a, a, a huge discrepancy between the cost of carrying data and the cost of carrying voice by, by moving it over, over to the packet switch network. But the, the PSTN is still going to be around. It's going to be around for a while. And while I don't believe that it, it, it makes business sense to go out and be a CLEC or to develop physical infrastructure on the PSTN, there will be a need for, for this, this interface between IP and the, the PSTN. And there will be some value add in being able to provide that in a way that, that customers can automate and, and, and scale with. I'll give you a couple examples. We, we have a customer now that has an iPhone app that allows you to choose contacts. Set a, set a time for a conference call, and instead of everybody calling in, it calls out to everyone. It's, it's a great idea. It's something you couldn't do with, with a traditional carrier where you'd need to forecast capacity accurately for individual countries. They have, they have customers in the United States, in India, in Mexico, and they may have 30 conference calls pop up, each with 10 people on, uh, at the top of the hour. With us, they don't have to worry about that, that capacity. We scale, we, we're able to, to distribute those calls out at how, however we need between our peering partners, between major, major carriers, PTTs around the world, to, to, to ensure that, that, that the calls get terminated with a high quality. And wherever they're hosting their, their servers, whether it's, it's on the cloud with Amazon in different co continents, for their customers in, who have calls in different places, they, they will be reducing their, their latency as well. But that's, that's one example. A, a, a more extreme example that, that, that we're seeing a lot of today are political campaigns. Political campaigns need 
need so, need to, to, for example, call 100,000 people the day before the election within two hours. So you're looking at about 1,000 a, a channels. You have 100 minutes plus time for retries, 120 minutes. You're looking at 1,000 simultaneous calls for a minute recording. And to, y you're looking at a hardware cost of $100,000 a channel to interface into the PSTN. If you go to a major carrier, they're, they also have $100,000 of equipment on their end that they need to recover the cost for. It's going to take three to six months if they want to bring out capacity to your data center or to your office. That's, that's an additional delay, and they're going to want a two- to five-year contract, whereas you only need it for two hours. So by virtualizing these services and making this, the, the system more automated and scalable, you're going to see more applications like this that people wouldn't have thought of developing. So, do you have any questions, Randy? I have a comment um, that will lead to a question, which is, I'm just looking at Twitter and I see that Skype for Business, Skype for Biz says, need a way to get in touch with Skype support? How about nine ways? Bookmark this blog post. I mention that because I pay for Skype service, and I think Andy uh, may also be a customer. In other words, we are not free uh, users. We pay for business service. And I can tell you that I don't care about the nine ways. It's hell to get in touch with somebody at Skype. And when there's a problem, you get a boiler. It's like Google. You get a boilerplate response. 24 hours later, they say, we are working on this. Don't worry. Everything's going to be fine. It's, it's just the typical thing. And that moves us to the question of support, which is, okay, you, you guys, if you're wholesale, we're not really talking about the 20 million users that are banging on your door like Skype would have, however many millions they have. Anybody know how many business users Skype has? Probably at least a few million, maybe. Well, they actually, but uh, Randy, they actually killed a large portion yeah. of Skype for business. They, they killed the SIP trunking product, pretty much. They killed the asterisk product. They asterisk did. product, totally. Uh, there is some legacy Skype accounts in that or might be business accounts but for the most part it was killed and it's gone in favor of Microsoft Link right. which is the business product so uh, but to I think you know Bayan can talk about how they support their customers the yeah that's support. what that's what we were getting to and I just yeah. wanted to mention that Skype may have a, a, a huge number of customers but the fact is uh, when I needed their help and it was for some stupid thing you know with their it was on their end. It wasn't uh, me not knowing how to do something. Just one of their services stopped. You contact them. It takes forever to contact them. They get back to you with boilerplate and so on. So how do you folks uh, deal with that scenario? Because that's really important, I mean, especially if it's wholesale. We have a very different uh, approach to support. And, and also, I, I'd like to, to clarify what, the, what we mean by wholesale. We, we have customers who, who spend anywhere from $5 a month with us to over $100,000 a month. A lot of the $5 a month users are more technical. They, they, they are more experienced. They are in the VoIP industry just because we're not providing package solutions. We're not providing the hardware. We're not providing the handsets. All of our, uh, all of our support engineers can look at SIP signaling, uh, are familiar with, with all of the RFCs relevant to SIP. They, they can, can analyze traces. They are uh, certified to work with SMS 800 for toll-free. We are a REST org. We have direct uh, uh, interfaces, uh, interface with NPAC for number portability. So we're, we're taking a, we're not taking the tiered approach to support. There is no tier one support where they're going to ask you to turn off your handset and your computer <laughs> and turn it back on. We're, and, and even when the problem isn't on our side, we take a very different approach to how, how we look at traces and, and RFC as well. If, if we get signaling that is unambiguous, but is clearly incorrect according to RFC, if we can fix it and normalize it without breaking anything for our other customers, we make modifications to our SIP proxies. And we normalize that signaling to try to, to, try to make it so that future customers don't have the issue when, when they're using buggy PBXs or gateways. So on, on, on the support side also, uh, 
most, most of our growth has, has been word of mouth growth over the past four or five years. And I, I attribute that to, to our support team because a lot of these five, ten, fifteen dollar a month customers who we have who are more technical, they use our service and e even though we lose money staying on the phone with them for a half an hour, an hour at a time uh, relative to how much revenue we're collecting, they're, they're some of the biggest advocates of our service. They go out and they, they tell businesses, they tell their friends who are entrepreneurs uh, about the quality of our service and our support. So, that should, does, that, that should, does, that, does that answer your question? Yeah, and I think it should work out. It's, it's the right answer. Um, of course, I'm not a customer, so I can't say whether that's actually the reality or not. All I know is the companies that I do deal with and as I said, Skype is certainly not the poster child for the greatest service, and nor am I paying them very much money for it. Anyway, so, go ahead. So in, in, in terms of service also, we, we're, we're one of the few companies that has telephone support where you dial in, you don't have to, to, to press any DTMF keys, you'll get a person <laughs> Wonderful. Quickly. And we're, we're also moving to 24-7 support for all of our customers in the next few months. So we, we will have 24-7 telephone support. It, for, it is, for all it's, customers. It's really ironic that the one that heaven is no IVR in this business, and yet we're all in the business of designing and playing with and making IVRs and recording them. Anyway, got a couple of questions. Uh, I guess uh, Paul Crick is not dialed in, or is he? Paul, are you there? Otherwise, I'm going to just start reading this. No, he's not unmuted. Uh, he says, I see providers starting to provide SMS-enabled DIDs, whether like Twilio, who sends SMS via HTTP post, or Vitality, who I think maybe do it via SIP. How do you see this full connectivity slash interactivity thing going in the future, and where are FlowRoute with it today? So we, FlowRoute has a private beta of SMS currently. We're doing it over SIP now, and we're going to be adding other interfaces in the future. Uh, we're, 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 just, we're just doing long code SMS currently, and we'll be doing short code later on. So, so we're doing long, long code bidirectional text messaging on all of our phone numbers. One thing we're going to be doing that's very different from Twilio and Vitality is uh, for, for, for at least the first year of our service, we're planning to offer bidirectional text messaging for free. Because for us, it's a very low cost, and it's a flat rate. To, to, to enable our service. So we, we are planning, when we go public with this, to offer a free bidirectional SMS. And, and it will be over SIP. OK, I'm just typing in an, an, uh, a URL very quickly. Um, OK, unless Paul says he's, OK. So that's the answer to that. Uh, another question was, and this is a great question from Lauren. Um, any movement or demand for HD codecs? Codex. <laughs> I long for the day of HD voice end to end. And uh, I don't think he's alone in that. I think that probably every person on this call agrees with that. Where are you guys with that? I think that there's, there's a need for HD codecs. Tr it, on the traditional network, you have a frequency range of, I think, 300 hertz to 3.4 kilohertz. So F is in Frank and S is in Sam can't be distinguished in that frequency range. You have a lot of, of high frequency tones that are lost. And mo moving to, to an 8 kilohertz band is, is a big step. Moving to 16 kilohertz band is, is going to be even better than that. The, for, but uh, I think it, it really depends on the type of service you're trying to provide. For, for us, being more of an interface to the PSTN, there's really no benefit in doing that because we, we, to, enable, to use HD codecs, we'd have to get in the way of the audio and we'd have to transcode and ultimately provide a lower quality audio going to the PSTM. So for FlowRoute, we don't see ourselves doing HD voice, except for perhaps some of our on net, just uh, having it as, as an additional option. But, but for anything that's going to the PSTN, it makes a lot more sense to keep it as G711 or G729 when people are trying to save bandwidth just because it's, it's such a standard on, on gateways that, 
that the major carriers have all over the world. Does that imply also that, that uh, but uh, th th this goes in two directions. One, you're not handling media generally. And if you're not handling media, then you should be codec agnostic because you're not handling the media. What the heck, right? But if you, um, the PSTN is kind of in decline, let's say. And, and there are sort of open discussions about uh, whether it's 2018 is the, the date that's been tossed around about um, sunsetting the PSD. And all that really means is, is um, a move to IP-based peering between the kind yeah. of carriers that you're interfacing with. And once, once that starts to happen, and it, it, it's starting now, but once it's more ubiquitous, then what do we care about codecs anymore? Because it's IP. It's, it may not be SIP necessarily, but it's IP. So gateways, the gateways functionally go away at that point. Although maybe SBCs replace gateways. I, I don't know. That's another thing. So, um, and what are SBCs starting to do? But transcoding. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, anyway, certainly um, we're big proponents of wideband. Um, uh, how does this? How does this interface, or how does this react to things that go beyond wideband, like? Uh, if you're doing SIP, what happens if I hook up a, a video-capable SIP endpoint to you guys? Video-capable SIP endpoint, we will we will complete the call. The only difference is that the video won't go through to the PSTN. It's I wouldn't expect it so to. It's <laughs> but uh, if if you send us send us SDP that that describes audio codecs that it, where you at least have G711 or G729. And, and G711, of course, is the same codec that's used on the PSTN. So if you want no transcoding, it's G7, G711 MULAW for the US, G711 ALAW for everywhere else in the world. But if, if you have anything else in your, in your session description with video, we will normalize that out when it's going to the gateways to ensure that that there aren't problems because there are a lot of buggy gateways out there. Whether it's 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 Cisco or or um, Avaya or, or or some of these these other these other gateways, some of them will break if you send video codecs. That's interesting. But we'll oh. fix that for you. <laughs> we'll fix that for you on the call before it, it gets there. <laughs> Okay, uh, I don't know if Bob, let me look at Bob. Bob, are you ready to, uh, you've got a question, go ahead. I do, yes. Hey, I was wondering, um, what, could you describe how uh, we might get started using Flowout in, in you know, a couple uh, easy sentences, and also, um, does Flowout support sub-account billing? So we send all of our PSTN calls from a pool of IP addresses, um, and we have a couple different internal clients, so we like to get, uh, you know, the vendor charges um, and for some of the providers we have we just had a pre we had different prefix prefixes for uh, uh, US 48 and international uh, for some other providers we have to go to different IP addresses um, if you could talk about some sub account billing that would be helpful so so the sign up process for Florida is it is pretty easy when you you start the sign up process it asks you what category of customer you are whether you're you're a carrier that's a contributor to the to, to, to the federal USF, uh, whether you're a reseller, whether you're a business, or an individual. And then for, 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 from there, you, you go through the process and you make a deposit, and everything is, is ready to go. You just have to choose to use IP authentication or SIP registration and, and credential authentication to, to receive and send calls. For sub-account billing, we don't have sub-account billing the, the, the same way that, that you may be used to. We do have a feature that uh, is, is unique, which is our CDR tagging, where on inbound and outbound calls, you can, you can set a custom SIP header, x-tag, and put whatever you want on there uh, and, and send it on, on a, any of the replies for an inbound call in 180, 183, 200, or on the initial invite for an outbound call. And we'll tag the CDR with that so that when you do a CDR export, you can, you can know what, if, if you've tagged it with, with a customer account, you can know which customers made those calls. The whole thing about sub-account billing is, is, is kind of complex because customers have very different needs for, for sub-account billing. We do allow for different 
separate accounts with the same uh, authorized IP addresses and so on. And that's one of the reasons why we use a tech prefix, so that if you have multiple IP addresses, you can change your tech prefix to identify which account you're sending the call on. But sub-account billing, where I, I, I'm, I, it's, it, it's, it's a little different. We, we have the tagging and... and no, uh, so I think the, the tech prefix and the, and the tagging are definitely, would, would, we'd be able to take care of that. That would be perfect. So thank you very much. Sure. Okay, there's another question in IRC, which is, and I'm not sure I see where this, I understand the question, I'll just read it and you, you can react to it. By, it says, a question for Flowout, the day they decide to change their market, what are they going to do to, what are they going to do to existing customers and how far are they from changing their model? Um, I'm not sure... Change, I'm not sure what, change, what that decide means. Decide to I, change your market. I'm not sure what that means. So if that person can type in a clarification or if you're on ZipDX, uh, open your mic. And, I and can say away. a few words uh, uh, sure. uh, uh, about that in that a, in terms of our market, we're looking to stay very focused. And the more we've our company has grown, the more focused we've become. We're looking to pro provide voice services text messaging, and other network database services like LRN dips and, and caller ID name dips and, and all of that th through API methods so that we can give an interface to whatever element of the PSTN you need easily. Uh, some of the things we're looking to do in the, in the future are also do translation of, of some of the SIPT, the, the, the underlying ISAP signaling, into SIP to give easy access to... to uh, uh, the line class classification, so you can see whether it's a cell phone calling your number, or uh, you can see the jurisdiction. So if you have a, a cell phone that's in New York, that's a California cell phone, you'll be able to see that it has a New York jurisdiction when it calls into your number. But uh, the the only change we're looking to in, in in our model is just expanding out, where we don't want to be a company like AT and T where if you have AT&T service in the United States and you open an, an office in Toronto and you say, I, I want telephone service, they say, well, you have to go talk to Bell Canada. We don't do Canadian service. We'd like to become a global telephone company providing local telephone service with minimal or no infrastructure wherever possible. But we're not looking to, to get into audio streams and everything like that. Twilio, for example, is, has become a developer playground. They're, they're very expensive. They're a few times more expensive than us. But they, they, they provide a very interesting tool, which is that you can write, write IVRs and other voice applications in their scripting language and, and put it up on their, on their website. They'll host the application for you. And it, they, they process audio and everything else. Since we're out of the audio stream and, and we have that belief that, that it it makes more sense. We're not going to be going in that direction directly, but indirectly, there's lots of open source software. There's free switch, asterisk. There's also commercial software that allows you to build these applications easily. One of the things we're going to be releasing next year is a, a translation uh, translation gateway, I guess you could call it, which, which is where, where we'll be creating ISOs for services like Amazon EC2 that will have prepackaged uh, free switch and, and things like that, that 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 will allow you to do very similar things as you can do on Twilio with a much lower cost and have the control and granularity of of managing your own system and tying into flow route. So it, in in terms of, of our overall market we're not looking to change. We're not looking to build soft phones. We're not looking to get into hosted PBX. We're, we're trying to solve this one problem, which is a very simple problem, but still pretty complicated to solve well. Okay, does that answer the question? All right. Uh, there was another thing that uh, flew by. Yes, okay, thank you. He said yes. Um, 
Mike is asking about, Mike, are you off your call? Maybe you could ask this question because you got little, let's see what he, I'm looking at him. Come on, Mike. No, he can't. All right, he's on the phone. He's asking about building increments. Uh, and he says one, one over one, six, six, uh, billing for ring. If you can decode that, uh, Brian, then you can, yeah. <laughs> you can answer it. Otherwise, I'm not sure. Billing for ring, we don't bill for ring time. Okay. Uh, billing increments, it's, it's, it's mostly six, six across the board. Mexico is 60, 60, and every carrier pays 60, 60 increments to Mexico. So if you talk for one second, you're paying for the full minute. We're also paying for the full minute. AT&T is also paying for, for the full minute to tell Max. And I think that's one of the reasons why Carlos Slim uh, such is such a very his, rich man. <laughs> such, yeah. <laughs> Richest man in the world. And uh, yeah, t t tell Max gouges everyone. And, and everybody pays full minute increments for that. There's nothing we can do about that or any other providers provider can do about that. Uh, the, there are a few destinations we pay 1-1 one, one increments on. But for the most part, our cost is six six, and and we pass through that six six cost as well. And for 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 general conversational traffic, you're looking at at a four or five minute duration average call. And so for a four or five minute duration average call, going from one one to six six is a change in, in average billing duration of three seconds. So it's less than a percent uh, difference in the cost itself. Let, let me uh, take that a slightly different direction because I find billing very interesting. I, I come from user space, not from from uh, sort of the, the carrier space. Um, does, does the mechanics or the infrastructure for billing, d does that in and of itself constitute a significant cost of operations versus um, the you know, actual delivery of the service? In terms of an incremental cost, computational cost, it's not that high. But from a development perspective, it is, it is significant. There, there are lots of things, where, especially with SIP, you have out-of-order messages sometimes or you have out-of-order transactions. When you have uh, routing elements like ours that aren't stateful, where our routing elements don't know about calls, we've distributed our architecture instead of taking an approach of, of a soft switch, which is just one box that does everything. We've split out our, our SIP, SIP proxies from our transaction matching from uh, all, all, all the other rating and billing elements of, of our system. And so the, there, there is a lot of complexity that goes into that, into doing it in a fast way and, and uh, in a scalable way that's horizontally scalable without just throwing on more CPU power and RAM, being able to scale out horizontally. Uh, it, it, is, it is a challenging problem. It's one of the problems that our development team has spent a lot of time on and continues to spend time on. To, yeah, I, was just, to, I was just wondering that I, I, it occurred to me that as, as the cost of actually delivering service sort of trends towards zero, um, I mean, the, the trend is, is in that direction, then the cost of administering the metered usage uh, has to be sort of a larger and larger percentage of the actual cost of service, I would have thought. But um, So may maybe for at some point somebody gives up on that and says, okay, we're going to treat this like we treat uh, cell phone calls or something like that. It's unlimited within some sort of societal norms or something like that. And then maybe we, maybe we at that inflection point, uh, gain a little bit of margin back because we don't have to, to uh, track and meter everything quite the same way. I think in, in terms of residential service, absolutely right. We're, we're, we're moving towards unlimited services. But it's, it's, it's difficult to, for, for me to see that happening for wholesale services where you have thousands of simultaneous calls to, to say that it's unlimited no matter what you want to do. Because there still is some, some cost to the infrastructure. There's, even before you get to the PSD, it, it, there's, there's, there still is cost in setup and teardown. Uh, that's why a lot of voice of IP providers, or traditional carriers for that matter, don't allow for, for predictive dialers to be on their network because it's a huge bog down of their network. Cool, great, thank you. Sure. 
Okay, any <clears throat> any other questions uh, for Flo Rout and for Brian uh, before we conclude? Anyone on the Hangout? We have a full house on the Hangout, by the way, which is not always the case. That's great. Nine, eight people besides myself and Brian. That's uh, that's a that's a pretty good record. Uh, yes, uh, I, I have a cool question. John, go ahead. John uh, Covici. What? Hi there. Well, what do you do for the uh, the people that want to do predictive dials? Do you allow that, or what? What's your? You care? So it, it 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 depends on the traffic profiles. Uh, for the most part, for, first of all, it, it 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 has to be legal traffic, but th there is a lot of legal predictive dollar traffic as well. We I hate them, but you know. <laughs> yeah, we, so it, in I can tell you that, that that we have very little predictive dollar traffic on our network, and it's primarily uh, for a business reason. Uh, our, we don't like it on our network because it bogs things down. We don't. Uh, our peering partners don't like it on on their networks. If if the calls are long duration, are uh, close close to a minute, there there's a high high ASR, a high ratio of answered to attempted calls. Then then that predictive dialer traffic looks good for us from a technical perspective, but but it also shows that the people that they're calling actually want to talk to them. So we we get less complaints from the FTC, less subpoenas that we have to respond to, and things like that. It's um, yeah, pr predictive dialing is 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 definitely an annoyance, and luckily, it's one of those areas where, from the technical perspective, for us and and other carriers, it it also doesn't make sense for us to carry the traffic. It's it's difficult from a business perspective, difficult from a technical perspective, and there's there's additional complexity for a company like ours be, because. We we have the complexity of handling high performance data and signaling while maintaining uh, accurate real time call data. All of our processing is for for call records and billing is done in real time, and it's it's done in real time not just for a single simultaneous call but but for hundreds or sometimes thousands of simultaneous calls, and we're t tied into that our fraud prevention mechanisms. I think the with with the direction of of SIP and Voice over IP, uh, especially over the next year, we we we've seen it already this this year this this last year quite a bit. There's a lot of fraud. There's a lot of VoIP fraud. It's a huge problem. Companies have gone out of business. The first the fir the 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 fourth month that Flowrat had had revenues, we were hit with forty thousand dollars of fraud over a weekend. And we we quickly started working on on mechanisms to try to limit that fraud for from the preventative stage, where where where, where we try to validate accounts, uh, validate phone numbers, and and to to do, do, just do some some other analysis to uh, to see whether people are coming through on web proxies and so on, but also doing velocity checks, doing checks on the 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 call the calling patterns of our of our customers on a destination by destination basis, uh, matching that up against blacklists, and we've done a lot of work on fraud prevention. We have an automated system that that that, that we put together, uh, where when there's potential fraud, we notify customers, we suspend temporarily specific destinations, send out emails, and and allow for uh, velocity thresholds to be increased and changed. Rapidly, but fraud, fraud, fraud is is a huge issue. Uh, the first year of our company, we had something like ten percent of our re of our revenue was fraudulent. Now, now we're we're close to three quarters of one percent. So it's gone down quite a bit. But it it's 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 a big deal. A, a, a lot of our customers, it it. Even with all of this, we've had individual customers come to us and be hit with five thousand, ten thousand dollars of fraud because their servers have been compromised or their credentials were compromised or something like that. That's uh, that kind of fraud is a little bit similar to shoplifting as far as the cost of a large uh, department store, and unfortunately, um, there's no equivalent to your customers unless you've got like a trade show with booths and somebody stealing individual things. 
but it's it's almost inevitable. It's it sounds pretty good that you got it down to three quarters under one percent is already probably a pretty good achievement. It's quite a business in and of itself, by the way, fraud detection. We've had several people yeah. on who work in that, and you probably know Nir Simeonovich uh, from Humbug Labs. I'm sure we know a lot of the same people who work in that, and it's a very specialized area. It's an interesting area as well, and apparently rampant if you don't know what you're doing is the threat of that kind of fraud. It is. I, I predict that we're going to see uh, a lot of these fly-by-night VoIP companies go out of business because of fraud. And, and we, we've already seen some, I think, uh, what, was, what was the name of this, that Canadian one? Uh, VoIPJet. VoIPJet had a lot of fraud. And it's, it's, it's one of the things that, that, that really hurt them in the end. I just got a uh, credit of $34 from VoIPJet. I was customer number 90 or 18 or something and when they first opened up. Uh, and that was maybe 2004, 2005. I posted about it. Most people already know about this. But it's really funny that after all this time, I mean, it's been years since I connected to them, that they did go to the trouble of looking through all their accounting that they kept uh, and presumably refunded money. And I'm, I'm really sorry that they had the problems. And yeah. I think it's extremely uh, rare that any company would worry about that. Many, many companies have gone out of business, in VoIP and elsewhere, by the way, who have said, well, you know, so let's not try to pay back anybody who doesn't sue us or whatever. So that was a pretty, pretty, pretty classy were, gesture. didn't know they were a Canadian company. I didn't either, but I do know that uh, I had an account with them, and they, I just got that through PayPal. Yeah, uh, I just got one Facebook. too. Yeah. Isn't that yeah, funny? It was, it was uh, customer number 48. They I have to go look myself up, but I think I might have even been like 19 or something. They, they or maybe were in the 70s. They were one of the earlier they, providers doing IAX. Of course, nobody. Do you, they were the you, cheapest, yeah. Yeah, you guys don't do IAX. We don't do IAX because we don't believe in doing circuit switching uh, uh, with voice over IP. So mm. we, 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 we want to separate out that signaling and media stream. It provides lower latency, higher quality ultimately when it's set up properly. Uh, VoIPJet, VoIPJet is interesting. The, the, the founder of VoIPJet, John, I, I, him and I were talking before either of us started, started our companies, before he started VoIPJet, before uh, we started Flow Out here. And we, we were both really interested in this space. And he was, he was a medical school student hmm. at the time that he started VoIPJet. He, he, was, he was in medical school and he set up a couple servers and, and, and threw some software on there to do some basic billing. and. And, and put the service together, but I, I, for, for, from what I recall, he, he, he saw this more as a way to, to pay his way through medical school, and, and, and I'm not sure what happened. We lost touch after that, but uh, it, 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 he, he, he wasn't looking at it uh, with, with a long-term view when he was starting it. I'm not sure if that changed somewhere down the line, but it, it, he, he was an interesting guy, and and saw a lot of potential in this early on. It's an interesting story, and a lot of there are m many, many companies have tried uh, to make money when there was money to be made on that kind of thing of the the per minute charges and all of that. And I think that's pretty much gone by the wayside. Whoever is left in the shakeout, it's it's. I tip my hat to all of you. Let's get the uh, final questions for Brian and and uh, see what else. And make sure that we can get to a conclusion because we got that Sangoma. Vega 50 gateway to give away, and I know people are waiting for that. This has been terrific, though, Brian. Thank you very much. It's excellent. I'm just talking, waiting for somebody to type in a question or to say the question. So I will now be quiet, and maybe Paul or uh, oh, wait a minute. Here we here's somebody. Let's see if uh, we can get this. Oop that that didn't go through the hangout, I guess. But uh, Carl, are you there? No? Okay. Anyone else have any final questions? Otherwise, let's conclude then, uh, by end with whatever you see uh, in the crystal ball for 2013 or anything else you want to say about Flow Route that we haven't said already. Well, it's, it's, uh, a, lot of it, a lot of it I think we've said already in terms of, uh, of, of fraud mm -hmm. becoming a bigger issue and everything. And j j just say one more thing about the fraud. Uh, we've seen people who've been hit by by $100,000 of VoIP toll fraud in one day. 
And so well, it's, it's, it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. Uh, I, I've seen velocities of, of $10,000, $15,000 an hour. That's the, the, uh, not, not on our company, not on our company. On, on, on our company, it's been, it's, it's been much smaller than that, but uh, there, there's, there's, been, there's been a lot of toll fraud, and, and it's increasing. The, uh, a lot of the attackers are becoming much more sophisticated. I think that for 2013, we're, we're going to see, see some kind of a shakeout in this whole packet switch, circuit switch setup in that uh, flow routes on its way to, to getting direct numbering allocation from NANPA. We are uh, looking to do that without becoming a CLEC, without uh, a, a charging access charges and things like that. So the cost is going to zero, but at the same time, we're going to be able to provide a service that, on voice over IP that's, that's more towards the technical ideals of SIP. And, and I think that, the, that, that that architecture will allow us to, to do it with, with, with a lot lower incremental costs of, uh, uh, of, of carrying the traffic and a higher quality. And I think we're going to see a movement towards that. There's, the, there's no big secret in a lot of the things that, that we do. That there are some technologies that, that help fix some of the lo loose ends that need to be picked up, uh, s some of the difficulties on the billing side and that side and so on. But we're, we're going to see a move to that. I, I think that, that some of these companies that are building SBCs, that are building uh, soft switches, need to be a little worried because it's, it's not going to be a good time for them when people start to see that SBC is something that doesn't make sense architecturally in a voice over IP system. It's better to have a slightly more open network and not have these walled gardens. So I, th I think that, that, that that's, that's it. We'll, we'll start to see more of, more of a, more of a um, transition on that end. And also with IPv6. IPv6 is going to make it a lot easier to, to have these networks where the signaling and media are completely separate, where endpoints will all be able to, to talk to each other. So You had to open that can of worms, didn't you? Okay. <laughs> no, we're, we're all watching that space. Of course, I, IPv6, uh, I'm actually connected mostly via IPv6 because I have a provider that has done that for a couple of years. That's terrific. You just check a box and you're on IPv6. But um, that's uh, quite a headache in, in and of itself. Anyway, I haven't seen any further questions. I'm looking all over in all these windows. I'm not seeing any further questions. Brian, I want to thank you very much. You've been a great guest. It's very, very interesting talking to you and hearing from you. Thanks, and I hope you'll come Thanks back soon. Thanks for having soon. me, Randy. Okay, thank take you. care. We're going to move, and I want to ask Joel for five minutes more of patience when we give, while we give away this. Uh, he's been waiting patiently. Uh, we're just about ready for you. We no have, worries. It's, uh, it's uh, almost about five minutes to the hour. So, folks, here's the question. Are you ready to win? Are you ready to compete for the Vega? Paul is looking very, very concentrated. Paul, watch the screen carefully. And every, all the, those of you who are watching the screen, I will read this. So if there's, like, horrible typists who are typing too quickly, you still have a chance to win. Everyone has a chance to win. I did give up the idea of, use, of doing a limerick. Like, you know, there was a gateway from Sangoma, who yada yada. Okay, so, no, <laughs> just give it. All right. So uh, we're going, what we're going to do is I'm going to put up a slide. The VUC has nearly been going for six years. Who's, uh, okay, somebody's typing in. You guys are distracting me from what I'm about to say, which I'm going to read the slide, the thing that you need to type in, but here's what you have to type in. It's only a few characters. It is the exact date that I'm going to show on the slide and then read a couple seconds later of the first part of what was called then. Does anybody remember what this thing was called when it started? Asterisk Users Conference. There you go. John Covici was there from day one, I think. The Asterisk Users Close Conference. Anyway. Almost. 
Uh, it was called the Astro Excusers Conference. We changed it. I talked to Mark, um, Spencer, and Digium, and we eventually got it much wider, and it's a good thing. We talk about a lot of other things. And I want someone to type in now to IRC, and the first person who gets this right will win the vague... Ah, implicit. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> Glad you cleared that up. The first person who is types in the MySQL formatted date that is year-month-day of the first VUC that is about to appear on the screen will win the Vega 50 Gateway. North America can uh, North America shipping free. Um, if you live in a co complicated country, you're going to probably have to wait a minute. Is that could that possibly be right? Wrong. Okay. Wait a little, wait for the slide, folks. Oh, wait a minute. You know what? I typed it wrong. Well, type in this whatever. Is it, <laughs> it's true. Type in what you see on the screen. I'll read it, and then I'll explain why I made a typo and it's the wrong date. Okay, ready? Here we go. Here's the slide. It's coming. Here it goes. Five, four, three, two, one. There's the slide. The slide says 2012-03-27. And of course, uh, Jerry wins, but uh, it was actually 2007. I don't know, boy, that was really silly. But the point is, whoever typed in, you saw the slide, I read it, and it looks to me like Jerry won. He's all, look at, he's rack, rocking back and forth. Jerry, turn on your microphone. How did you do that? You have to specify that uh, you were not informed, so he's got no microphone. Uh, disqualified, no microphone. At any rate, I have a microphone. Okay. I just I was too many windows open simultaneously. So How did Jerry, I, do that? I typed it on my ten keypad. Yeah, and you saw the slide. Okay, the folks, the actual date. I'm really sorry about the typo, but it doesn't matter for the contest. It just added a little element of mystery. The real date is 2007, March 27th, 2007. So we will have been running six years of the VoIP Users Conference. This is number 415. By the way, I need to toggle the uh, ZipDX recording, and then we're going to move on to phone.com in just a few seconds, maybe a minute or two. Recording is toggled. What was that? Somebody was about to say something. Go ahead. The tube slide was, yeah. <laughs> There's always somebody that's not happy with the fact that somebody else won. I, I feel that way too in life, you know. It just That's the way the cards are dealt. Yeah, my, un, my unfair advantage is that uh, as a teenager, I was a proof operator in a bank, so my 10 key skills are pretty pretty scary. <laughs> and it is true that the people who are, those of you who are blind, uh, obviously I read the thing a little bit later, so that's that. That is a little bit unfair, but the limerick thing, you know, nobody is really into that either. There once was a gateway from Sangoma who, all right, never mind that. Let me introduce our next, our next guest, and um, I'm going to have to ask him how to pronounce his last name, but I'll make a guess. What the hell? It's Joel Maloff. Is it Maloff or Maloff? The latter, Maloff. Maloff, okay. Let me just correct that by putting the proper circumflex accent over it. For my own, uh, all right, anyway, kidding. Phone.com, now we're going to talk in a whole other space here, and you may even have some carryover answers from what uh, uh, Bayan just said as well, because you're in a completely different area. Let's first of all uh, go back, uh, and let me ask you the same question I asked him, which is, who are you exactly? Uh, Joel, where did you come from? You personally, I mean, what's your background? Well, actually, I'm probably one of the older ones in this industry. I started uh, with what was at the time Chesapeake and Potomac Telephone Company in 1974. Spent 10 years with the Bell System. Um, my last assignment for AT&T was as macro analyst for AT&T on IBM. And you can interpret that as spy, <laughs> which was a wonderful assignment. Taught me a lot about uh, strategic analysis and strategic planning. Uh, I then got involved in the emerging uh, alternate long-distance carrier business and eventually ended up with a consortium of fiber optic carriers that were building networks across the country. And I ran all of the marketing for the combined joint venture. It was called National Telecommunications Network. 
while I was there in the mid 80s, uh, we were approached by a group of universities that wanted to link supercomputers together. Had no idea what that was. Uh, within about eight or nine months, I found myself leaving NTN and doing consulting uh, for people like Al Gore uh, in the development of the High Performance Computing Act for that year. And shortly thereafter, became the uh, executive director of the Big Ten Universities Research Network, uh, which was one of the forerunners of the National Science Foundation Network and what we know as the commercial internet today. Uh, did that for a while, uh, then went off uh, doing consulting uh, around the world, uh, have written several books, lots and lots of articles, and then found myself back in the, the VoIP space, initially in uh, SIP trunking. And almost three years ago now, I ended up starting to work with Phone.com. And uh, just to segue, uh, Phone.com is a provider of hosted PBX services. Uh, we do not do uh, any wholesale uh, services at all. And I am responsible for uh, having developed the agent program, our channel partner program, and also business development. Any major relationships uh, that generally falls into my bailiwick. Um, I'm the oldest one in the company, as far as I know, um, and we range from 20s to 60s. So uh, I, I bring, hopefully, experience and uh, some sage wisdom to the company. So basically, Joel, you haven't done much with your life. Not at all. Anyway, let's move on to uh, what phone phone.com, first of all, it's an expensive domain name, uh, but what else? Well, actually, it's in interesting that you mentioned that because <laughs> uh, the company essentially started from the domain name. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a, a gentleman that has a business uh, in acquiring domain names. He happened to have this one, uh, found a group of entrepreneurs that were uh, some pioneers from the industry and we essentially, I, I was not there at the time, but the company put together a business around the domain name and clearly it's been uh, very successful in gaining traction within the marketplace. It's a terrific name at any rate. Um, let's get into uh, what the specifics are of phone.com now. I, I looked at the website by the way, obviously it's easy to find. Sure. Uh, so, and there's a there's a decent graphic showing, and unfortunately, I don't have it ready to show, or I should have maybe, uh, showing the different the there's four areas. Actually, it's in the post. If you go to vuc.me, anyone who's listening to this, you'll see that graphic. I'm pretty sure I reproduced it there. In fact, it looks to me like Jerry is showing it. So basically, business, virtual, home, and mobile. Let me uh, get you rolling on that, uh, Joel, and you can explain all this to us. Well, uh, we are, as compared to other some other companies in this space, we are primarily focused on the business market, uh, but it's the small business. We focus on anywhere from uh, Soho, one or two lines, up to 10, 15, 20 lines. Uh, we certainly can do more than that, but that's the market segment that we've been addressing. We do have a home office, uh, or excuse me, a home service uh, that we provide, but that's probably 10% of our customers. So we've really been focusing on the virtual office as either a supplement to existing small businesses uh, or as a replacement for traditional premises-based PBXs. Okay, and I'm leaving space for somebody to jump in here. Look at Michael must be on another call. Uh, you guys are going to have to help me out with questions here, so type them into IRC. In the meantime... Well, I can add a little more, Randy. I, yeah. s some of the... I mean, there... There are many different companies doing what we do in the marketplace today. And one of the first questions that I'm asked is, okay, well, what makes you different? Right. And I think the easy answer to that is that we have decided to focus on a specific subset of the marketplace. Um, if I can borrow from 
some of the work that I do with our agents. Uh, our agent program has about 120 agents. Um, many of our agents are actually people not in the traditional technology business, but rather in the um, business assistance, if you will. They help companies that are looking to get started, raise money, uh, develop their business plans, that sort of thing. And one of the first directives they tell someone who comes to them saying, I, I've got a great business idea, whatever it is, um, I need to raise money, I need your help, they say, fine, we'll help you do the business plan. You need a business phone number. Here's the link to phone.com. Go sign up for one. And as with many of our competitors, we offer a 30-day free trial. So there's no harm, no foul. You don't like it, don't stay. Most of them do. Uh, and in this way, they have that business phone number that they can then start building around. We have been very sensitive to the kinds of features and functionality that our customers are looking for. Uh, we offer all of the standard bells and whistles. We have a what we consider to be a very nice uh, um, customer portal that allows for all of the call queuing and configuration that you would wish. Um, these are all very useful features uh, for our clients and we've been adding, our customers have been adding more. Um, for example, we've recently added the ability to do uh, call recording. If you're a small business for training purposes, for a verification of what was discussed, you can record calls using our, our service. Uh, we've added a uh, analytics tool that our customers can actually look and see uh, who are the people that are calling them? Where are they calling from? And lots and lots of details. That's a service that's available. So, uh, and one last thing I didn't mention in my probably too long introduction of myself, I also am an adjunct professor at Colorado Technical University and I happen to be teaching disaster recovery. Uh, one of the areas that a hosted PBX can actually work very well for is for disaster recovery. Uh, instead of having a physical uh, premises-based system that is at risk for flood, fire, or tornado, if you configure the system correctly using the cloud-based functionality that we offer, you should be able to maintain business continuity. And that's something that small businesses are really interested in because they don't have the luxury of multiple locations and so forth. Now, I think I've stalled as much as I can, Randy. Have you any <laughs> other questions? <laughs> Let's, uh, well, it's not so much my questions that are of interest, but anyone else's. So uh, anyone in IRC or on the call, I would just, appreciate just, ah, just, look, just looking through the list of, of supported devices, I see sure. you support uh, some of the more significant ones, some Polycom, some Panasonic, some Cisco sure. Link, Linksys type stuff. Right. Right right down to the ATAs, old school ATAs. Um, yep. um, do you uh, have any plans to support any kind of uh, video? Uh, the answer is yes. We actually are currently supporting video via our uh, communicator, which is our soft phone. So we do support video through that. Um, if you're asking, are we planning to support video phones like the Grand Streams or, or SNOMs that do video? At the moment, I, I don't know that we have any firm plans. We've talked about it, but haven't offered it yet. Haven't seen a great demand for it in our particular marketplace just yet. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, sitting with, uh, I know Randy's got a, uh, a Polycom device with a camera on it sitting in sure. front of him and I'm mm -hmm. supposed to have that same camera uh, later on today so it's it's just a current topic of consideration that if you're in the higher end of the Polycom realm they're all becoming video enabled. Sure, well and I think the issue for us is is it something that our customer base is looking for um, and as soon as we get demand for it I have a feeling we will step up to that. Uh, ask you a little, a little further question. I see you're using what looks like Berea as your communicator. Correct. Uh, um, which we're all quite familiar with here. Um, what 
what kind of penetration are you seeing in that? I, I'm interested in in the degree to which people are actually uh, either using soft phones on on computers in this space because this sure. is the space where I exist, uh, or uh, alternatively using soft phones on smartphones, which I, I see a lot of a lot of talk about it, but I don't see a lot of people around me actually making that sort of part of their mainstream working life. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. Um, there's a lot of talk. Um, we certainly felt that it was important that we introduce it. We've only introduced uh, the, the Bria app probably within the last oh, four months or so. So in terms of uh, uh, take rate on it, I don't know those numbers. I'm just not familiar with them. But my suspicion is it's probably not been huge. Uh, but I do expect that to to start to grow, but I haven't seen any numbers on it. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, I, I have, for example, in the, the, the people that I work with, we have maybe, oh, well, half our staff have smartphones. Sure. Uh, of that, two-thirds of them are Android phones, a third are, are iPhones. Um, interestingly enough, all the company-issued phones are Android phones, um, but the um, owners and the senior executives pay out of their own pocket for uh, iPhones. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, yeah, it is. Um, and, and all of them have some kind of smartphone app, mm -hmm. but they only really use it when they're painted out into a corner. Like I, I got a call from somebody on a smartphone because he was in a hotel in Mexico City, and, right. and uh, per minute calling out of there was going to be huge. Sure. Uh, so he spent a week making use of it. But but it, it's sort of peripheral to their regular um, polycom phones that we tend to use all the time. Yeah, I think that that's probably an accurate statement for us as well. It's, uh, again, something that we're going to continue to stay with. Um, but is it a main part of our business today? Probably not. Okay, cool. Other questions from anyone? We're looking at IRC. Go ahead, somebody. somebody I have a question. Oh, sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. it's so, just looking at this, uh, as far as I can see, you're primarily US centric, which is uh, quite reasonable. Do you have any offerings in any other countries or any plans to do so? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, I, and in my role as business development, I probably get asked that at least oh, three or four times a month. Um, the short answer is that we do actually have uh, customers that are not in the US, uh, but they're using our services for access to the US marketplace. Uh, for example, uh, a, a company that's in Latin America uh, wants US DIDs or US toll-free numbers so that their customers can contact them, but they're located in Latin America somewhere. Uh, that's something that we do right now. Um, we have considered partnering with other organizations to do other uh, international destinations. And I actually have a PowerPoint that I provide to people whenever they ask me, uh, would you be willing to work with us? And it asks such things uh, as, uh, do you have a license to do this in your marketplace? Do you have access to DIDs in your marketplace? If you've got all of that, then yes, we would consider working with you. But to date, uh, the answer has been, okay, thank you. No, I don't have those things. Yeah, that's, that's a tough nut to crack. Um, every time we get asked to test services or we find new services uh, involving conference or tele telephony of any kind, uh, as I happen to be in Europe, the first thing I note is that it's always, especially conference servers, uh, for example, the last one I tried, I mean, it starts to dial on my cell, it starts to dial its call in the United States. Uh -huh. uh, ironically, that call would be free for me because that's what my carrier does. We have unlimited free calling to 115 countries or something, but in the infinite wisdom of whoever wrote this program, it doesn't put 001 <laughs> so or, or plus one, whatever it is you have to put. So those calls are not going to work. Anyway, long story short is that there's a shortness of vision um, a lot of times in the development area, but what you're talking about... Um, Joel, is not a shortness of vision, but a difficulty 
of interfacing with business all over the world. And that's unfortunate because it, it limits our possibilities, all of us. Yeah, I think th there's a couple issues. The first issue is doing business in another country. In most cases, they still want local phone numbers. They're not looking for U.S. phone numbers, which I can provide. Right. Um, I can certainly provide DIDs from you know a hundred or so countries through Voxbone and and others, but those are costly. It's not the same as having a local number there, and so then you get into the issue of a, a local customer service. Uh, you get into the issue of making sure that you're not in running afoul of any kind of regulations uh, and so forth, such as having to have physical facilities in those countries. And then lastly, uh, probably not lastly in terms of importance, is the technical functionality. Um, we have two points of presence in the United States. Both of them are on the west coast of the United States right now in California. Uh, we are in the process of adding another one for geographic uh, diversity in the east coast, probably the New York, New Jersey area. But even so, if you get into uh, some of these other countries, you're going to run into issues of latency and delay, which we don't want to tolerate in terms of the quality that we deliver. So there's lots of issues that need to be considered and right now we're still a relatively small company uh, we are focusing on um, what we do well rather than trying to spread ourselves too thin do I think that the international markets are, are important and something we we want to do probably so but only under the right circumstances and in the right timing yeah, there's no question, and uh, the big words, in my opinion, of the day are more roaming and mobile. Mm -hmm. And when I say roaming, what I mean, I don't really mean roaming. What I meant was uh, the question will constantly come up, I'm going to Europe, how do I get, you know, I need, a, I, need a, my U, I need my U.S. number to be forwarded to me, and I need a local number in France or wherever I'm going to be. Sure. Uh, let's not even talk about people who are going to six different European countries, but just somebody who maybe goes to Switzerland or something. Mm -hmm. Now, you've got all kinds of uh, solutions to this, but they're all, um, they're all workarounds, sort of. I would, I would classify them, the Sims and the True Phones and all of that. I wish James was here. He could, he could uh, argue with me on this. But this, that stuff's all a little bit of an improvisation. And at a, an outfit like phone.com, you would like to be able to say, hey, you know, we can do all of this. But, sure. But um, for reasons you just explained, it's not easy. And I just wanted to say one further thing, which is that you may not be a huge company, but let's face it, Google Voice has been talking for how long? Two years now about starting in England, testing, uh -huh. right? In England, not, you know, in other countries, in sure. other European countries. And if they're having trouble and they have almost infinitely deep pockets, obviously whoever's, you know, the other companies that are in the space even close are not going to be able to do it either. Sure. It's a negotiating nightmare, I'm sure. Oh, it is. So we can get back to the U.S. market, and now we've justified why it, you know, we're not able to transparently provide all kinds of numbers all over the world easily. Yeah. Let me actually add something else that, that is an interesting, call it market, for us. Um, mm -hmm. We do have relationships with uh, business development uh, agencies from several foreign countries. Um, foreign to the U.S., forgive me for anyone else who's not in the U.S., um, where they promote our service to small businesses that are looking to have access to the U.S. market. So let's say it's a business development from a European country, and they want their companies to have not only toll-free, but local numbers from New York and Chicago and Boston to appeal to uh, prospective customers in those areas. We do that today, and that we do very well. Okay. Looking to IRC, BKW is having an animated discussion with lots of gestures, but uh, anyone have any questions? Andy, any comments? You look like you're raising your hand. No, he's raising his hand to scratch the back of his head. <laughs> Who's going to help us out here? Otherwise, I, I will ask.
ask a question. Oh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. So, Paul's in Canada. Go ahead, Paul. Don't hold that against me. Um, in it is a foreign country. <laughs> Canadian born, UK bred, I don't know, go figure. Um, I always find it interesting when I see companies that sell bundles of minutes with a sure. permanent rate for overages. Uh -huh. And no agenda, I'm not going to you know, slag it one way or the other, but I was wondering, you know, on average, what sort of percentage of your customers end up going over limits and buying minutes? And, and for those customers that do, do they end up sort of bumping up to the next level or are they okay just with, you know, a marginal overage here and there? Yeah, I, I, too, I, I understand your point. Um, I don't know the percentage that actually are paying overages, but I can tell you from a marketing and business perspective, it's really our intention to get them into the right plan. The overage numbers, in my opinion, are high, but they're intentionally high. We'd rather you be paying that fixed amount um, than having you go into the overages. I don't know the percentage. I don't think it's terribly high. Um, haven't really heard much complaining about it. And let me share with you actually something that um, hasn't been brought up but may pertain to that sort of question, uh, and that is our uh, churn rate in terms of competition. Um, one of the ways that we measure that is by looking at the numbers that are ported into us from our competitors as opposed to the numbers that we have to port away to a competitor when we've lost business. And the last time uh, I checked it, it was something like 14 to 1 coming in. What that tells me is we're probably doing a reasonably good job in terms of not only uh, pricing the product so that people are satisfied with it, but also that then gets to customer service quality and so forth. I know I sort of went a little bit afar from your question, but I hope that answers it. No, that's good, and that's interesting. And I think, you know, speaking from a consumer point of view, I'm all about X dollars for whatever I get and we're right. done. I mean, right. you know, we've, we've seen it with the cell phone carriers. I mean, when I started, you know, back in the UK, you paid, you know, 10 pounds a month for your line and you paid sure. for every single minute. And then right. I came to Canada and it was like, oh, no, we don't do it that way. We'll sell you a bundle of minutes. And I was like, oh, this is different. But now, sure. you know, back in Europe, they're doing the same thing now because people like bill certainty. They like sure. the fact that at the end of the month, it's 30 bucks and, you know, chances are they didn't go over it. Now, where the pet peeve with that is, is, you know, where we're going with data on cell phone plans. But sure. that's a completely different discussion. That's for another session of the VUC. Yes, yes. Indeed. indeed. Okay, and speaking of the VUC, uh, there was a question. Let's see. Uh, yeah, and Simon's with us, and uh, that was with regard to the earlier discussion of uh, avoid fraud. Phone buff is asking: Do you offer IPsec, Open VPN, gate, VPN gateway support for road warriors connected to the service? That's a pretty good question, actually. Uh, yes, and I didn't mention my master's degree is in information system security. Um, the the short answer that to that today is no. We're not offering any kind of uh, VPN functionality um, other than the standard uh, work that we're, we're doing internal to our core network. But no, we're, we're not offering a um, essentially a VPN service today. Okay, I got another similar question, I, I'm afraid, which is going sure. to be about, uh, because this is the inevitable question of HD voice, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so, Codex and Wideband? Yes. Um, we're yeah, we are. We support uh, G711, G722, um, and are uh, moving forward with that. Uh, you know, I've got a, a Polycom HD phone sitting on my desk, um, so we are prepared to support whatever our downstream carriers will support as well. Mm -hmm. So we're doing that. So, in the, and, and let's face it, that, as uh, we mentioned with uh, Bayan, and as we all know, I mean, if you're going through the PSTN, obviously that's of no importance because right. it's, it's scrunched down anyway, uh, and mobile don't even let's get started. But sure. if you're talking on a, 
a setup where the corporation is talking to the branches, you can yes. be HD, in other words, what you're saying. Absolutely. Absolutely. And video was mentioned, uh, Michael mentioned it, and I'm afraid I was, uh, had to distract it for a second. So if we have these Polycom phones, for example, that do VVX 600s or the 1500 series, uh, those are, if those are connected in, again, in, again, in an enterprise situation, is the video going to work? We are not offering video as a service mm -hmm. like that today. Um, but to be honest, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if they plug them in and use them, would they work or not? I actually haven't tried it. Andy, do you know that? A lot of times, um, if you're doing plain SIP URIs, you can call using the soft client. You turn the video on. Um, there's, you know, I use that all the time with various um, SIP service providers without you know, blinking an eye. It just, especially things built with Counterpath. I mean, it looks at it, it says, IP is IP, packets are packets, SIP is SIP, VoIP video, it, it turns it on, it turns it off. What it does, it, and it can even do usually three-way calling. Um, I haven't tried that with phone.com, I should, I guess. But the um, you can do three-way calling and have the, a three-way video call. Now, where where does it break down? You know, the networks break it down, the, the mm -hmm. carriers don't break it down. And now, can I do, I, because I don't know the answer to this, can I use my communicator soft phone and call someone who is on a, uh, a Polycom video phone and have a video session? I can only answer that in, as far as what I did today uh, through ONSIP, our hosted PBX, um, two extensions on the same PBX. We're both HD and video, and that was Bria to the uh, VVX 600. Okay. So that did work. You know, I, I think uh, Andy's right. I think it, it, it's almost like well, try it and see because yeah. sometimes there is interop interoperability difficulties, and it's not even anybody's fault. It's just that there is there are so many possibilities out there, so many things to go wrong, right? Sure. But you're obviously that you, no one is blocking the video. But I was curious if you were uh, developing anything in that area because conferencing is a little bit of in video. I mean, is a little bit of different ball of wax. And we're yes. sitting here on a free service. Ten people are doing a video conference with audio switching. By the way, three years ago you couldn't get this almost for any money. Sure. Interesting little point. Again, Google Deep Pockets able to do that, uh, but if because phone.com is a company that people are going to be connected to, you got your enterprise. In other words, again, sure. scenario. My favorite scenario is always people in different countries. They're talking basically on SIP, mm -hmm. so you know then they've got their PSTN interfaces in one or more countries. But when they're talking to each other via SIP. You, the possibilities are large. However, you, you're what, the answer to your question was that you haven't developed anything in particular to aggregate video or have any public-facing video or anything like that. Well, actually, I would slightly amend your statement. Oh, good. We have, we have not announced anything. I knew that I could we'll get you. That. To, I knew I could get the uh, the pearl out of the oyster <laughs> <laughs> by putting a little sand in. Okay, so we'll look for that soon. Still looking for some more questions. Oh yeah, there was uh, Joseph is asking about uh, SIPS TLS. Uh, TLS is probably go ahead. No, no, um, please finish. Me. Well, that that was the question, and I was just going to say um, I would fear that it would be similar to the, the VPS question, but go ahead. It, well, it is. It's the same thing. <laughs> we're we're not offering that as a specific service. Again, keep in mind that our target customers are generally small businesses that have 10, 15 lines. Um, if they've got more than one location, it's two. Uh, so it's not the kind of organizations where we've had any demand yet for uh, those kind of security or VPN settings. As we move upstream into somewhat larger organizations, 15, 20, 30, 50, I absolutely expect that those will be requirements. But for right now, we've actually been doing uh, fairly nicely with the marketplace that we've targeted, well enough that we were we made the Inc. 500 uh, this year as I think number 200 and something fastest growing companies in the country. So 
one of the challenges with a small company is keeping focus and, and staying in the areas that best serve you while at the same time looking at what do I need to be doing next to make sure that I maintain my viability. Um, that's why we've really focused very hard on that small customer segment. So what's the sweet spot? What's your, your ideal customer? Um, ideal customer is probably 10 to 15 lines, uh, maybe 15 to 20 employees, uh, could be a law firm, accounting office, doctor's office. Uh, those are the kinds of customers that we're really doing well with. Um, also, uh, we've done very well with um, teleworkers, uh, people that are doing medical transcription or folks at home. There you go. Well, Pick me, me too. Pick me. <laughs> yeah, well, but it makes a lot of sense because you have, I mean, I'm hooked up to our hosted PBX. You can dial an extension and get to me on, on my phone sitting on my desk, but I'm sitting in Baltimore. The president of the company is in New Jersey, and our technical staff is in San Diego. doesn't make any difference. And those are the kind of companies that I would say fit into our sweet spot. And, and how, uh, if somebody approaches you and they are um, complete neophytes and they're looking sure. for a more complete solution, how uh, do, do you have any arrangements to, to uh, bundle bandwidth with the service or to, to partner with somebody on that or how does that work? Yeah, that's an excellent question and that's a thorn in my side. Um, the reason being we, we have been asked for that and are now increasingly being asked for that. I know people, so I call people and I say I need help uh, uh, with bandwidth. One of the challenges is that a lot of the people that do uh, um, wholesaling of bandwidth are looking for a T1, a PRI or whatever or larger they're not interested in providing bandwidth for Joe Schmo, who's starting a shoe repair business. So that's one of the challenges that I have, but let's just say I'm very interested in developing uh, relationships to be able to do exactly that. And clearly, someone like, uh, I, now I am particularly uh, happy with today, knock on wood, uh, Comcast business class service here in Houston, Texas. Sure. Um, but I have a business case for having reasonably fast, reliable internet access and I, I, I justify that without respect for my telephone service. Sure. Uh, it, it's in the nature of the business that I'm in. But Joe's show, Joe Schmo's shoe repair may not feel that way about internet access and he may be enamored of the 999 low speed DSL that AT&T is offering because sure. yeah whatever so yeah it's it's complicated i accept that and that was a good answer <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, thank you i want to try and jump in here on that point michael the um, i think if you're serving the public the and providing internet access to the public, whether it's a coffee shop, restaurant, library, bookstore, uh, hotel, etc., that um, there's a, a, a big knowledge gap of what it's, what's required to provide real-time communication. Most people think internet access is the web and um, email coming through either a client or going through your web browser. There's very little understanding of what we all use every day for real-time communication, whether it's voice or video or screen sharing. And when we all get out into hotels and coffee shops, we hope we get quality access that we don't have a, a problem where the packets arrive out of order or we get buffer and jitter and packet loss and everything else that happens. And I, I, I think all of us have to do a better job of educating those quote public internet spots. And I say public, but they're not free. They're not, uh, Esme Voss and I had lunch in Paris three days ago from Muni Wireless and we were laughing at how T-Mobile had all those hot spots and they worked great when they first started and they kept working great till they killed them. Now everybody's saying, why did they kill them? You know, those, the, the Starbucks hotspots were great 
up until the time they became AT&T and they converted from T1s to um, DSL lines with an upstream of about 256. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, you've got Comcast business, I've got Cox business, my house, my ex-wife has SureWest, which gives her 50 megs up and down. Oh, Malik's got 100 megs in both directions. And um, other people are still <laughs> s struggling along with 512K. Sure, and and look, I was I was seriously thinking about giving my parents one of the little biscotti devices. Uh, <laughs> they just they just added a um, you know they just got a their first HDTV, but they live up in a part of uh, central Ontario up in Canada, where you know bandwidth is just not available, and 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 just as Cisco got their, you know head handed to them with Yumi, there's still a lot of people out there for whom um, a megabit each direction is, is uh, barely achievable or maybe even not achievable. So, But as you say, and the other thing is if, if you're in that SMB space, uh, convincing people that you know if your phones are going to run over the internet, well you're going to need um, UPSs. Absolutely, you're going you, sure. you're gonna need to to take sensible steps, as as you're saying. You you teach disaster recovery, right? I take do. sensible steps to ensure that your your uh, small office or home office uh, network stays up uh, during power outages. In my case, during hurricanes, uh, <laughs> and 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 sometimes that means actually spending a few extra bucks on redundant sources of IP. Mm -hmm. uh, in my case, I still maintain a Covad DSL circuit. That I use, I'm I'm serious. Only maybe once every 90 days, hmm. but um, you know, through two hurricanes, that service never went down, and so we we wanted to stay connected, and it was worth every penny. Great. So uh, I have a question, but before that, Simon Woodhead is with us on IRC. Uh, I don't think he's on the call, but um, let me scroll wow. back up. Are you are you are Mr. No. Simwood? Hey. Yeah. And his question was, and I'm trying to find it, but basically it was, what about infrastructure? Are you, um, why am I not seeing this? I should see it, but I wish I could find the exact question. Who's, uh, Simon, uh, <laughs> type the question in again. I th it was regarding infrastructure and whether you're using... Oh, and he's muted. Okay, let me try to unmute him. This is going to be a long process. Yeah, he's probably saying, whose soft switch are you using? Basically, uh, I think that was it, but let me try to... Randy? Well, I... Yeah, hey. there he is. Hey, it's Simon. Okay, hey, Simon. Fabulous. Go ahead. Hi, I'm, I'm trying a new uh, Jabra headset, so this is, uh, this is glorious. Um, my, my question very quickly was um, what uh, infrastructure specifically um, software stack are you guys running? Are you sure. Running? Are you running a selection of open source solutions or, or, or big name? Uh, we are not using a Broadsoft, um, which is the first question that I'm often asked. Um, and I, just as an aside, um, in a prior life, I was a, a chief technology officer of a publicly traded carrier, and I did buy a Broadsoft. Um, the problem is, at least in this business with the market that we're in, it's very hard to figure out how you're going to make money with the fees that they charge you. So the short answer is we are using uh, a combination of open source uh, systems, free switch, and some home developed systems uh, that we've been able to continue to evolve over the uh, almost five years now that the company has been in business. Okay, great, thank you. And it, is welcome. that distributed? Uh, we do. Ha we have two points of presence. Uh, one is in San Diego. One is in Los Angeles at the uh, One Wilshire Carrier Hotel, and we are planning on adding a third point of presence uh, sometime during the coming year, probably in the New York, New Jersey area. But location has not been right. uh, designated yet. Right. Okay. So a customer is designated to a specific data center, or. Uh... Will they fail over to other sites? Oh no, it would fail over to to either site, and we've had no outages uh, that have totally compromised the network. Everything uh, we've had some uh, uh, issues that affected a particular set of functionality, but in the at least two years that I've been with the company, uh, there's not 
been a complete compromise at all. Thanks. Oh, that's interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll shut up now, Randy, and go back no, to No, I was but, uh, <laughs> telling, it, telling Andy Abramson he needs to sit up. He's got his... His lower third is over his <laughs> eyes. Um, I, I had a question. It's a, it's a very, very simple problem that almost, That's the every, mask. That almost everybody has. The mask, sure. Yeah. Um, which is a provisioning. Yes. So, so I'm, um, I'm a company with five extensions in one location, let's say. Um, right. First of all, um, what am I doing for phones? I mean, do you handle that? Do you have an offer that includes phones? Uh, hard phone, obviously. Sure. Hard. And then, uh, what's the what's the provisioning? And what what kind of hand holding is available for that to get that all installed? I know nothing about this stuff. What is this VoIP stuff? No problem at all. Um, first of all, we have what we consider to be a fairly friendly uh, user interface that uh, you see a service that you're interested in. Uh, let's say that you were referred by one of our agents because you need to have a phone service and you. Uh, got a couple people and you want phones. You go online, uh, it steps you through it step by step. Do you have existing numbers that you need ported? What are they? We'll check right now while you're online automatically to see if we can port them. Okay, we can. Or I want new numbers. Whether it is a new number that's local, it's a new number from another city, a toll free, whatever. Drop down menu, select those. Do I want international numbers? Drop down and select those. Next we go on to what service plan do you want? How many minutes do you think you're going to need? Um, how many extensions do you want? And you can set all of those up. Then there will come a point in this progression where you're asked, do you have existing telephones that you want to use? If so, what are they? Um, if they're analog phones, we will provide to you an ATA free of charge to use. Uh, if you want uh, IP phones, we have a variety that we will sell to you. Uh, those include the, the Polycoms and the Linksys. Um, we do the Panasonic hands-free um, portable phones, mm -hmm. which actually have been very popular uh, because they look exactly the same as these small offices have been using, except obviously they plug into the router rather than into a jack and RJ11 in the wall. So we do all of that. Uh, it then comes to the end. You put in your credit card, sign up, and if you're not ordering hardware, uh, within a matter of an hour, you're up and running. Does that answer the question? Oh, there it was does. another. Well, there was another part to your question. You said, "What about handholding?" Um, I'm I'm a real neophyte. I have no idea what I'm doing. Help me. Exactly. This is something that I, I want to uh, follow up from the discussion that we had earlier uh, with FlowRoute. We actually have a customer service and support group that is 24 by 7, and it is all U.S.-based. We do not offshore to folks in the Philippines or uh, India or anywhere else. Not that there's anything wrong with that. We just choose not to do that. Um, and so anyone can call in and say, okay, I tried to use your website, but I'm not even capable of doing that. Can you help me? The answer is absolutely. Sure. Let's step through it. We'll do it with a live person. When we get to the agents that I work with who may have more complicated environments, they might have potential clients that have multiple locations. Um, they may be looking for uh, uh, unlimited calling from some of their their uh, employees. Well, we have a sales engineer. Um, they're on the West Coast, so they basically are available from 9 a.m. Eastern to, to uh, I guess, uh, 9 p.m. Eastern. There is a live sales engineer that can help with much more uh, detailed opportunities than the typical customer service rep. But yes, we're there to make the experience as easy and as enjoyable as possible, regardless of the level of technical comfort 
I think that this is an area really, and this is exactly in the target that you've expressed here. Um, what I've seen, you know, because I'm in, t in this area, people often ask me for advice, believe it or not. I'm mm -hmm. no way a consultant, but, you know, any of us probably have had a family, uh, maybe sure. business and so on. And they ask you, hey, um, what do you think? Well, I finally called um, some people who I know are great, and I said, hey, I'm going to send you somebody I mean, uh, I asked them to send their commercial guy over, and the guy talked to him. And what happened was was extremely um, typical, I would bet, which is that they somehow tried, quote, unquote, VoIP with somebody, uh -huh. and or internet calling, whatever it was, and it wasn't perfect. There was packet loss. There was some kind of problem. So this guy went over there as an engineer and spoke to them and did a presentation, and um, they said, you know, in the end, we've decided to go with, I think, I think it was like Orange or some, some local, um, sure. you know, just a local carrier here, which was, by the way, a huge mistake. I'll explain some other time when we have three or four hours. Uh, but the point is that it's a hard sell sometimes. And the person that I'm referring to that might call you and say, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm sure. not talking about the average Joe or Jill out there that's confused. I'm talking about someone who's got uh, a travel agency and 10 phones that are, you know, four lines and 10 people answering them. Sure. And hey, this is costing my money, me money every second that it's down. What right. do I do? So presumably ah. you got people who can, who can take that call and say, okay, how many phones you got? How many blah, blah, blah. And you, you get right to the, this is what you, what you could do. And this is pretty much what it's going to cost. And, let me let me run you through it. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Okay, while I was blabbing away, let me see what questions came up in the uh, um, is this for you? It's uh, we, and I will get to that the flow route thing in just a second. Sorry about the uh, speaking of flow. Uh, Michael's talking about HD voice so phone buff is this is your question for uh, for Joel? Is that it? Yes. Okay. So, phone buff says, if I buy, so if I buy six phones from you, six phone from you, set them up. Sometimes the questions on IRC are not constructed grammatically uh, perfectly, but let's try this. So I buy six phones from you, right. set them up. Right. Over the slow Bell South DSL, I can't talk on all six phones at once. What now? And that's a great question. I mean, I was, was joking about sure. the fact that there's a comment missing, but what is the answer to that? I mean, because that, that's what happened to my customer, my sure. friend who asked. Is that well, hey, it's probably the DSL was at fault? Well, and, you know, this is a double-edged sword because with my customer service folks, the first thing that they would think if somebody comes in and says, okay, I, I've installed your service, it's not working right. Um, we have to make sure that we have trained our customer service people to not jump off that bridge and say, oh, it must be your bandwidth. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. So we, you know, I can tell you as a rule of thumb, um, I will tell people that in order to use our service, G711, you need to ha firstly understand what is the number of concurrent calls you expect to have, and then what is your bandwidth that you have. Round numbers, I know these are a little bit off, but use 100 kbps per concurrent call. You want three concurrent calls, you better have at least 300 kbps that you can use for that. And that doesn't include downloading documents, uploading uh, files, and so forth. That's got to be readily available. There are some ways, depending on the routers and, and terminals that you're using, to try to do packet shaping and so forth. But for our, from our perspective, you need to have at least that amount of bandwidth. Then, once we are comfortable that you actually do have that bandwidth, we need, need to make sure that there are no configuration issues. Um, we, will, we have documents that we've created for each of these devices that say, here's how you need to configure or set them up. Um, and we will work with people until we get it right. We have a group of engineers that generally get involved with those. So um, 
I'm not sure if you're showing me lunch or not. But I'm you're trying to show. Me I'm sorry, I was trying to show Fred <laughs> my chocolate dessert. I did not, in any mean, want to interrupt you. But the, but the problem we're talking about. I'll get to the chocolate dessert in a second. The problem that we are talking about is a serious one, and it's exactly what happened. Now, um, the thing about orange, by the way, and any other local, uh, you know, orange here is like AT and T or something. Mm -hmm. um, and the the advantage they have is that. They control everything. They've got the they've got the box, the modem, the router. Right. So, for example, our provider. I happen to know that I could be downloading. Bob was uh, joking a second ago about um, torrents and don't download torrents and so on. Sure. Well, in an right. office, that's probably not going to be a problem. But the point right. is that somehow the box that we have, which is which does its triple play, so it's got TV, VoIP, and uh, internet. Mm -hmm. Somehow it. The, Q the QoS is set up in a way that we can't touch, and it the calls work no matter what I'm doing. Uh -huh. I don't know. You know, I could be downloading at 24 megs a second. Huh. As I don't see a difference. So apparently they have somehow separated it out, and um, they they just they somehow do it. Whereas if you are not controlling the DSL, which I think is always the case in the U.S. Correct. Right. By the way. Um, you are you do have a big problem there in that you have to start telling them these are the specs. Does, is async? Um, I mean, I'm sorry. Is synchronous DSL? Is SDSL common in the states? I think it's not. Not as much. No. Yeah, yeah. SDSL is largely offered to uh, businesses at hellacious. Uh, prices. Well, yeah. we are kind of talking about small businesses, but it wouldn't be cost effective for a no. small business in my, probably, right? The, the, the issue um, in, in the U.S. or with any operator is really the, the service provider doesn't go out and test what your capacity is. And I remember Voxage and Dean Elwood built a um, thing for Skype as a Skype bandwidth tester. It was going to be used in Probably in their business offering, it never happened. But the the one of the biggest challenges we all see is does the purse does the prem have enough capacity to handle calls? What what Orange is doing is what AT and T used to do when we all had Call Vantage. Those of you who were fortunate enough to sign up and use Call Vantage for the three or four years it existed, uh, they actually groomed your traffic every night. They would what they were able to watch what you, your voice and data usage was and throughout the day they uh, they packet prioritized and controlled the bandwidth so that when you were on a call the they were throttling back your email and your web surfing mm -hmm. and your sharing of files and so forth so Randy you're talking about you got a 24 meg connection you're getting a file down it, it, the the network's grooming it. So you might be downloading an iTunes video that says it's going to take 20 minutes to download. Well, it takes 22 if you end up on a call because right. Orange is just managing which packets are coming to you. So that's why your calls sound so good. I would bet that they're not managing your video. So no, exactly. Were, exactly, Andy. And uh, it's, by the way, it's not Orange. I would not be with orange. I know, you're on free. It's awful. It's free. You're on free. But, but whatever they're doing, and, and again, see, they've, they've got, I'm not in focus. I'm really sorry about the bad focus on the dessert. <laughs> uh, it's enough of that anyway. I haven't even had lunch yet. You're, you know. Well, so. it's, it's dinner time here. Oh, I know, dinner, but right? I haven't Dinner had time lunch for yet. you too. <laughs> Look yeah. at those two polycoms, by the way. Isn't that amazing? Um, so this is, this is one of the biggest problems because it's out of your control. And, and that really is awful because you can only do a great job in what you actually control. Absolutely right. So with that, well, wine goes with that. I'll tell you that in a second. Uh, let's see. We're about five minutes to the hour. We need some more questions. If anybody's got any, how can Florout order some of the dessert? We'll get to the final comment on Florout because there's this there's the offer to the VUC members, and I want to get that to them. Um. But before we do, let's let's finish talking about phone.com. Have we missed anything, Joel, since uh, people are not coming forth with questions other than about my dessert? Yeah, I think the only thing that I, I would share with you, you haven't really asked me about uh, competition. And one mm -hmm. of the areas that we feel very strongly about as a company uh, is that we recognize that we need to be more than just IP dial tone. 
Now, if that's a glass of wine, I'm really, really <laughs> jealous. <laughs> Uh, don't tell me it's a it it's a nice Bordeaux or Cab. Well, since you mentioned it, it's it's very very surprising because it's a California Zinfandel. Really? Which one? Yep. I showed it on the other hangout. Let's not get too far afield okay. because we're let's well, let's let, uh, get Joel's. Yeah, let, uh, let me finish my comment. Yeah. I think one of the issues for us is that we want to be and and will be more than just a provider of internet dial tone. Uh, there's lots of other companies that can do that. The uh, barriers to entry are not very high at all. We have focused on a specific target market and we want to be more than just the provider of dial tone. So we're going to continue to develop a suite of services that helps small businesses wherever they are, uh, be able to be more competitive uh, with, with in their own marketplaces. Um, and uh, just we will be as responsive to that as we can. That's something that I'm, I'm stumbling for words because there's being the person involved with uh, business development, I've got a lot of good things on the agenda, none of which I can talk about. <laughs> but the the idea is that we want to build into being a business utility rather than a phone or dial tone company, if that makes sense. It does. And with that, unless there is a final last minute question, where's Carl Fife? Carl is our resident. Uh, I've got one last question for you. He's, <laughs> he's a, kind of a Columbo, the Columbo of VoIP, right? Uh, Randy, I, I just have a, I, I don't have really have a question. I have a comment okay. looking Looking at uh, uh, Joel's pricing, um, it, it looks to me, and, I, and I'm uncomfortable recommending Google Voice for people, though I like a lot of the functionality. So the, the sort of personal line pricing you have is, is uh, I'm going to try it out, and, and it might figure prominently in some of my recommendations. For when someone's looking for a Google Voice type feature, I wish you know um, I'd feel more comfortable if they were charging for it. Um, but uh, paying you and having customer support is going to be a big priority. Well, one of the things that I would say to that, I thank you very much, um, get signed up to our agent program. And if you're sending people to us, get paid for it. I'm, I'm overcompensated as it is. I'm just happy to give people good advice. Then, then, I, then I'm happy to help you. <laughs> Although I can't, I can't remember the last time somebody told me that they were overcompensated. Uh, my, my wife is not in earshot, so I can say that. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Whoa. All right, gentlemen, I think that's it for us. Uh, we should probably cut off the um, hangout on air simply because it's gone to two hours, and that's probably enough for any human being. Uh, I want to thank you, Joel, for uh, being patient, first of all, and for coming in and giving us uh, the uh, scoop on phone.com. It's uh, certainly an easy place to visit, phone, P-H-O-N-E.com. Thank you, and uh, hope to see you again. My pleasure. Thank you very much. It's great to have you. And uh, since he's still here, I'll thank Bayan again. Uh, uh, thanks for Flow Route. And we do have a little announcement, by the way. Thanks. It's, it was great being here. It was terrific. And um, as uh, Sean typed in, which I now have to find again, <laughs> they have a little offer, a special offer for us. What did he say? He's throwing in uh, the dessert. Okay. No. Um, which was a... Since I don't have it in front of me, five dollar credit, correct? Somebody nod or help me out here. For if you sign up for Flow Route. Yeah, that's right. For the, for the VUC, you need to, and I'll find this and put it into the uh, the article that goes with this. Here it is. Okay, so I'm sorry. So Flow Route offering a five dollar credit for any VUC user that signs up today on the service. Just give the support guys a buzz once you sign in the credit support at flowroute.com. Thanks, everybody. We're going to go off of the broadcast. You guys that are on the Hangout, stay around for a while if you like. Well, that'll still stay up, but the uh, live part of the broadcast will end. ZipDX will, of course, still be on, so uh, nobody has to leave or do anything. Just the video facing the eight people that are happen to be watching it will go off right about now. Five, four, three, two, one, one, two, three, four, five.